and the cats to fill the crawl. And the tanks went on and they pulled along with an independent air. And their guns began to blare. And now it's time for top tips for researching your family history with our very own Miko Pellin. Now it's fair to say that Miko has history in his veins. He's worked for Find My Past for a number of years now and is responsible for spreading the infectious enthusiasm for family history through social media, presentations, and events all around the world. You've even seen him in the US once in a while. Now he's going to reveal his top tips and tricks to help you use Find My Past to hunt down those missing ancestors and fill the gaps in your family tree. Miko? Hello Josh and hello everyone else out there. I am from London. Uh, today I'm going to tell you a little bit more about what you can do with the records on Farmer Past. And you've had a great primer from Amy Sell and there are a lot of people coming up that will tell you about some fantastic records that we have. But I'm going to give you some little tips that you can take with you and you can use with all these records to try and find perhaps missing ancestors or just to get further back. Fantastic. So. You've made a start on Farmer Past. I'm sure over the weekend you've been trying free records or you've been building a family tree and doing everything that you've sort of been recommended in the earlier presentation. And what happens next? Uh, that's the big question. The first biggest kind of recommendation that I have is just to use the tools that you have. Find My Past is a fantastic resource. Uh, about 20 years ago when genealogists would have to go to an archive and move from record to record and date order and hope that they might catch their ancestor's name. It was quite an arduous task and I think people from that era would give their right arm for something like Farm My Past at that point. So there are billions of records on Farm My Past and the worst thing you can do is get no results. So there's absolutely nothing wrong with experimenting and trying as many things as you can to try and get the answers that you need. And when you do get that ancestor, everything's been worth it. First big tip I've got is inspect everything. Take a look at every single part of a record. It's all there for a reason. Uh, if you're perhaps looking at a census, look at the families on the same street. Make a mental note of who they are. You'll find people who live in small communities tend to flock together quite often, and uh, you may find them popping up in other records. I've got an example here, a, a marriage record, just to prove that every part of the record that you find is important. Most people would perhaps look at that and get the marriage date and the obvious details of a father's name, uh, the father's occupation, and the ages of the couple, but there's more details. If I perhaps have more than one marriage that might be plausible, I can look at things like witnesses. And I can see that quite often these are friends of the family or relatives. Um, I've seen many times that a sister who may have married a little bit earlier and so have a different surname may crop up. And we may find these witnesses reappear over time. So it's a great way of confirming or denying uh, whether the relatives that you're looking at are yours. My next tip would be to let your tree do the hard work. There's so much to look at in family history, it's really difficult to keep track of it all, and I know my mind definitely is not in the right state to uh, balance it all out. So what I do is I lay out all of the facts that I can find from every record, and I lay them all out in the order. And that way I can just plot the life of an ancestor, and I can understand more about what they were doing at a certain time. And then if I do find a record that looks possible, I can see if it's plausible. I can keep track of everyone that's linked to this person and I can perhaps see their occupational changes and even changes in their address. So I do that using the Farmer Past tree and I just recommend as soon as you put things out like that, you can quite quickly see if there's something that looks a little bit amiss. There's a lot of ways to search cleverly on Farmer Past and some of them might not be so obvious, but once you get the hang of it, you can find things very quickly and very, very cleverly. This here is a record A to Z and this is almost like a second home for any kind of avid genealogist. Uh, currently, you can search right in the top. If you start typing a word, say census, it will just pull out all of our censuses. And on the left-hand side, we have different regional variation selections. So you can perhaps look for just British censuses or American censuses. You can get to the A to Z of record sets just by either clicking on A to Z of record sets on the search records drop-down, or there's a little box which is on the top-hand right of every search screen. And when you get there, every individual record set has access to new fields of information. These are fields that are only relevant to that record set. So, for example, the 1940 census in America has a field for race. 
And we do that on purpose just to make sure as people will enter information, we want to give you the best chance of getting the record that you want. And if there isn't a match, those records won't appear, which may well actually be your ancestors. There are extra fields like mother's maiden name, which is absolutely imperative for someone looking for um, th what happened to a woman, especially in Britain, uh, these sort of times. If you look for births and baptisms, you can use this information to go further. Another tip that I would give is, with this record A to Z, you can just search, but you can also take a look at everything that we have, and it's worth taking 20 minutes to half an hour just to look through the almost 4,000 record sets on Find My Past and understanding what we have from where. There is a phenomenal amount of material, and they cover everything from cracker salesmen to full censuses of uh, countries. You can find that just on the left-hand side, just below the regional selection. It just says show list of everything. And when you click on that, the search box turns into a full drop-down list and you can scroll to your heart's content. Wildcard searching I'd like to talk about. And this is um, something that when we find our ancestors wrote things down, uh, Sometimes with literacy issues and when someone mishears something, which happens a lot when someone's moved to a different community, uh, people could have mistaken something or even in a human process like transcribing billions of records, every once in a while a letter may change or may go awry. So you can use different symbols to replace these. If you use a star, that represents none or as many letters as are needed in a space in the word. So for the examples I have, at the top, a star would pick up Cleland or Clement or anything like this that needs to be in between. If I use a question mark, that means one letter only has gone missing. So if I use a question mark in the space of the star in the example I have, it would only pick up Cland or Clond or Clint, just only the one letter. And um, you can combine wildcards to reduce your results as well. If you have a feeling that vowels would be the things that would be an issue, then perhaps you could put in two stars or a star and a question mark, etc., just to make sure that you are narrowing down the results. It's really helpful to find those stray records, especially when you know that your ancestors should be in a particular place and you haven't quite found them yet. A good tip for looking for these missing ancestors is just to say that less is more. Always start with as little information as you can and then build up. Start with literally just a name and see how many results you get. If you get too many results, then start adding extra details like location, etc. Um, you'll soon find that there'll only be a handful of results left and then you can inspect those in more detail. Use everything that you know to get more information from the records that are left to look through. So if you know a mother's maiden name, put that in. If you're looking for a marriage, um, enter the spouse's name. Um, if you know her maiden name, add that too. And just keep going and eventually you'll soon find that there will only be perhaps one or two results to look through. Over to you. All right. Well, thank you very much, Mikos. Some great ideas. Now, we have a couple of questions that have come up. Uh, the first is, does anyone have any suggestions for finding living relatives? So how can you, you build on leads that you might get from Find My Past? We do have uh, modern records on Find My Past. We have um, modern electoral rolls, and we have uh, company house directors lists. Um, these may give you an address, and they may tell you a little bit more about living relatives, and I'd suggest maybe perhaps using a phone book or something like that. Um, you can find a lot of those online, and if they're in the directory, you might find more. Um, although I always recommend perhaps writing a letter rather than ringing up a new relative <laughs> out of the blue. It might get you a better result. <laughs> I, I, we have another question that they've only been able to get indexes of records on Find My Past. How do they get the actual record? It will vary from record set to record set. Some record sets are indexes on Find My Past and the genuine record will be available to order somewhere else. Some indexes are transcribed from some of our partnerships with various family history societies uh, where someone has gone to the archive and written down what they've seen and quite often there'll be some extra supplementary information just on the side of the search screen which will tell you where the record set came from and how you can get more information, how you can find out where to find the original. All right, wonderful. So the next question, do they ever make mistakes on records when it comes to birth dates? I would say definitely. Um, when you're telling uh, someone uh, a detail about the birth date, 
uh, sometimes you may want to fib a little bit. Uh, there are people who want to join the army, who want to look a little bit older, and there are people who want to marry someone quite a lot younger, who want to look a little bit younger themselves. There are quite a few reasons why. I would say always lay out as many facts as you have and work out which one is the anomaly and then try and create a logical reason for that. If there is a reason and it's still plausible, you can use other facts in perhaps the same document. So if it's a service record, you could look at addresses or next of kin to make sure that you still have the same record. As long as you have a reason for why that fact might not be quite accurate, then you should be in the clear. Right, because part of that same question, which you've answered part of it, is how do you reconcile the different dates that you find? So you might have a census record that gives you one year that you can date back from and a birth record that gives you something else. How, how do you reconcile that? It would definitely be a case of finding as many records as you can. And then, as I said about inspecting other parts of a record, using these other parts just to make sure that you're looking in the right place. All right, wonderful. Uh, one question we have, do outbound passenger lists exist before 1890 in England? They do, but not in very good nick. There's no um, complete collection, so uh, anything you find would be quite piecemeal. Um, and so generally, it's not something that we can uh, put online. All right. And, and just to clarify, the Fund My Past has access to the outbound passenger lists from 1890. We do. Um, we also history. have quite a lot of passenger lists, perhaps on the other side. If you knew someone went to, say, America, you can check that for them in New York or New Orleans or mm -hmm. uh, Philadelphia. Yeah, and one of the things that I love about the passenger list collection that Find My Past has, the outbound list, is that it's anywhere in the world. So I know I had American relatives who traveled in through the UK and then out to other places in the world, and so I picked them up. We've got some there. fantastic Australian records as well, which you can do exactly the same thing. And it's great to see the start of a journey and the end of a journey and understand in some ways how long a journey took or anything else about that. Yeah. Absolutely. So, so we, we have another question. Uh, this one's a bit of a tricky one. <laughs> so here we go. We're going to test your knowledge. Uh, how do you go about finding adopted grandparents or, or parents if there were no records made of the adoption? If there were no records made, that's quite a difficult one. Um, I'm, I'm a little stumped. Um, <laughs> I, I, would, I would say that I would look at elder records that are possible, so I would talk to perhaps a, um, a local uh, social services department or who was in charge of the adoption process and find out what is there. Um, I would assume that there will be records of some sort and perhaps uh, you might not have looked in the right place for these records. I, I think it's quite rare that a child would just be given away without some kind of paper trail. Um, I think you would have to look quite hard though and I would recommend perhaps talking to your local council. Yeah, no, it depends area to area. So I yeah. mean, one thing that a lot of people can do in the US that they don't know about is while there are not records that they can search, they can write the adoption agency mm -hmm. and get non-identifying information about their parents. So like what their religion was, how old they were, and you can sometimes piece together that, who they were through some of the census records and yeah. that. But yeah, there's always, I wouldn't say that there might not be any records, but there might be records we haven't thought of yet. Yeah, definitely. Okay. What about divorce records? Ooh, um, we do have divorce indexes on Farm My Past. Uh, divorces didn't really happen that often in the past. Um, they're a relatively modern phenomenon, and so um, they were quite expensive uh, traditionally, and um, only a few people did that. A lot of times people were married for better or for worse and until death does depart. Sometimes they may disappear and find another spouse somewhere abroad. Um, I've seen that happen a few times where someone has just got on a boat and married someone else on the other side of the, the world. But um, it's always worth checking if an ancestor does disappear from a family and your relative is not listed as widow or widower. And you know, sometimes you can find divorce records within court records as well, you you know, can, every yeah. once in a while, especially the older the divorce records. <laughs> sometimes it gets more and more prominent. Yeah. So yeah, it can be an interesting one. So we have a question about finding birth records from South Africa around 1919. Okay. Um, Miko. <laughs> I'm not really a South African expert. Uh -huh. uh, expert. Um, I've been there. Uh, <laughs> that's about as far as I can go. Um, uh, I would say um, there must be South African birth records and, and I would start with Google, which is always the place that I go to, especially if I, I know exactly the sort of records that I'm looking for and it's um, quite a useful place. Um, but check our record X to Z first just to understand what we have and if we have anything that might cover that area. Yeah, and it also might be a good idea to ask that question to Twitter, you know, so sort of do at find my past but then ask others because that's a great resource for folks. I think so. I'm, I'm sure someone out there will Step someone, in. Yeah, so, someone knows the answer. 
And, and, and we have a similar question for any records of a Swiss family on Find My Past. Uh, not on Find My Past, but um, I, I know that the Swiss keep fantastic records, and so they will be out there. Um, Switzerland is quite lucky in the fact that it hasn't been ravaged by a lot of the European wars that have gone on over the past century, and so a lot of these records survive. Um, I would consider um, perhaps uh, consulting either a Swiss expert or, again, starting by looking for the particular record sets you want in, say, Google or somewhere like that to see if any are online. All right, wonderful. Now, we have a question that is about making trees public on Find My Pass. So is someone's tree public on Find My Pass? By default, all of your trees are private. You have the choice whether you want to make your tree public or private. Uh, the great thing about Find My Pass is that it's not just uh, one switch. You can have a public tree, but you can make as many facts as you like, public or private. I have some details about certain relatives that perhaps I'd want to keep to myself, and so I would keep them as private facts, which would mean people could look at the names and the dates, or perhaps even just the names, and then I would have this information to myself so I can share and collaborate with other people, but always keep the things that I've researched and spent a long time on that I'm perhaps maybe even not so sure about until I'm certain, I can keep them personal and I can keep them to myself. Yeah, that, that is one thing I know earlier we talked about, you know, someone asked the question of how do you reconcile different dates? And I always say, well, it's important to record all the variations mm -hmm. you find. That's one thing the tree allows you to do is you can put in more than one birth date for someone and you can document all the differences you have. And you could make some of those private or public depending upon how much you want people to see. Definitely, definitely. I, and there are a lot of people with certain kind of skeletons in the cupboard and some people always love to find the black sheep other people less so and again the power is always in your hands and that's the way it should be when it comes to privacy absolutely so looking through some more questions i know we have a couple of irish questions which i'm going to leave to brian i think he's there. probably best uh, but, but we do have a question about the next update of percy that's going online mm -hmm. and, and i'm just curious i know the answer <laughs> uh, so, so I want to know, when is the next Percy update going to happen? Uh, I know that Percy updates happen regularly. Um, I would say, um, would it be within a month? It would be, it would be. Fantastic. Yeah, it's, yeah so, so the exciting thing about Percy is, as you know, sort of be, being with the social media team here, we update mm -hmm. Percy once a month with images. And, and they also ask when the images will be done. And the answer to that is, of course, it's going to take a long time. <laughs> uh, there's more than two and a half million articles indexed in Percy. And literally, that represents over 8,000 individual publishers. So we are literally traveling across the globe asking for the copyrights and the permission to publish all 8,000 titles. I found some great stuff in Percy. It, it sounds like it's an American-only publication, but it's not. There are so many things in there that cover families in Ireland and Britain and, and around Europe. Um, I was recently looking for Jewish families from Central Europe. Uh, there were publications that had full family trees, photographs. Uh, maps, locations, I found fragments of um, Jews in German censuses all listed for me. Um, I even found the full published genealogy of Jay-Z, um, oh. which was a great <laughs> read. For the, thing, the things you find in Percy. <laughs> I, we have a question at Back on Trees that this customer has a one-name study, and they're wondering, can you create multiple trees? You can create as many as you like. Um, I like to keep them in a nice order, and I think a lot of people like to have a, a tree that they're completely certain, and then an extra tree where they can play and they can start adding things and see what makes sense and just try and understand a little bit more about what they're doing. And so um, there's no limit that we've found, and we've definitely tried to, uh, to test as much as we can. All right, wonderful. That's all the time we have for questions. Thank you very much, Miko, and we'll get set up for our next one. Thank you very much.